I'd like to talk next about the relationship between market systems and political systems, and particularly choice in market systems versus choice in political systems. This is a key theme in the work by Charles Lindblom, the author we've been referring to this week when we're talking about market systems. And we tend to associate uh, choice and control, some of our themes today, with democracies. Um, we see this as a hallmark of liberal democracies, that people are free to express their opinions and free to make uh, political choices. But of course, what happens in a democracy is that you get to choose between political candidates and the political parties they represent um, once every couple of years, once every three years, four years, five years, depending on whatever the uh, electoral cycle is. Then once having chosen your representatives, we kind of leave it to them to get on with governing. And then, of course, if we're not happy with uh, that huge set of policy choices they have been responsible for, they have presided over, then we may choose to vote for an alternative candidate next time. Choice in market systems works rather differently. Of course, every single time we go into a shop, we choose one thing rather than another. So we're making lots of micro choices that collectively add up to a discipline upon all of those participants in the market, everyone who wants to sell us something in the market. So both have their advantages and their disadvantages, of course. They work to different ends. Uh, the complexities of governing a modern state, a modern society, means, of course, that we need some continuity, some, some, some stability, and we also need heavy reliance on expertise. Of course, when we see uh, a time of crisis, such as a pandemic, uh, we all understand in some sense that uh, you have to bring in the experts and you need speedy decision making and we can't start doing direct decision making by taking opinion polls of people and, and, and making lots of decisions on complex social um, issues. Of course, uh, consumer choice day to day in consumer markets raises this basic in issue of information. On what basis do we make our choices? Where do we get our information? And information is a key resource. Indeed, the focus on information has been a significant feature of uh, the study of economics in the last couple of uh, decades. And we will look very specifically at information and information asymmetries and indeed government interventions to make sure there's more information in, in markets, um, in financial markets, in consumer markets, to make sure that markets work better. Markets that work well generate information and help to share information and indeed uh, price itself we'll see is a very significant signal. The very uh, fact of large numbers of consumers buying or not buying something transmits information and we will come back to those issues. So the basic difference in terms of accountability between a political system and a market system is, in a sense, the frequency of choice. In a market system, you've got consumers uh, making regular decisions. Even if it's uh, a decision that any individual consumer might only make every number of years. So people might buy a car only three, five years, or indeed recently in Japan, it's up to nearly eight years people own a car before they buy another car. So no individual consumer, of course, is making that, those purchases every day, although you, you might buy, buy milk every day, for example. But collectively, lots of consumers are making those decisions. So it brings a discipline upon companies. Now, of course, when there is no competition, even though consumers may not uh, like the way the firm has been behaving, they effectively cannot discipline the firm by buying from a rival. That's why monopoly, which we've already briefly talked about, is such a problem. And that's why governments often intervene to try and promote more competition in markets. Of course, if we think to the difference with politics, though, we realise that the striking feature of the modern state is it is a monopoly. It has a monopoly on 
force. It is the only institution in a modern society that can compel us to do something. A private actor cannot compel another private actor to do something. Of course, if you've entered into a contractual arrangement with somebody, that you've signed an, uh, an agreement to pay a certain amount of money or to provide certain services by a certain time, you have committed yourself to doing that, uh, so there is an obligation. But there can be no arbitrary forcing of one person or one organisation to cooperate with the will of another in a market system, per se. States, of course, can do this. And this is, in fact, one reason why many economists have argued for privatizations, that when the state owned a whole range of businesses, whether it was electricity providers, airlines or whatever, telecommunications companies, for example, there was no competitive discipline, that competition brings discipline upon uh, businesses. And that when there were state monopolies, they didn't have that. Of course, on the other hand, if they're a state monopoly, they might serve social purposes, uh, not just seeking purely profit. Anyway, this notion of discipline is a really important one, because ultimately what this means is that, as I say in the slide here, the final slide on markets versus political choice, in markets, the markets themselves may be free, but the sellers, the participants in the markets on the sales side, are not free. So when you hear people criticising the ideology of free markets, don't assume that means that it's just free for companies to do what they want to do. The very opposite. If, there is, if it is a truly competitive market, the firms in the market are far from free. They are heavily disciplined by the presence of rivals, by competitive rivals. You know, of course, uh, in the run-up to an exam, you're free to not study but your awareness that other people will be studying and that you would like one of those scarce higher grades, the A plus or the A grade, for example, means that you will feel a competitive discipline to do some study, not that you're actually being forced to do it. So competition, of course, brings discipline. And when we talk about discipline, it means service orientation. It means innovation. It means anticipating the needs of customers, and ideally um, anticipating needs of customers before customers can even communicate, can articulate their needs. Uh, we very often didn't know that we needed something until we actually saw the product. Uh, the product uh, speaks to something that was missing in our lives, in our setups, in our routines, for example, something that makes our life easier but which we had never even imagined a solution might exist. So the competitive uh, disciplines upon companies lead them to innovate, to try and create new products that fill a gap in the market. Of course, once something takes hold, once clearly there is demand for it, once customers are interested, uh, and when there are a number of firms competing to meet that demand, they're going to be looking around for anything that gives them a competitive advantage. So they're going to be reaching out to a whole range of companies. Uh, they're going to be collaborating with a whole range of people. And we see, for example, in the case of the snowboarding industry, and we, we've looked at this example in our, in our first week, um, that very significant technological innovations, design improvements, solving of some elementary problems through feedback from the user or users of the products uh, led to a really rapid uh, increase in the sophistication of the products uh, that makes of course the product more attractive in the first place and then attracts more users and as a result we saw a huge boom in the snowboarding industry if anyone gets a chance, uh, do wander into the Burton flagship store in, for example, Omotisando or wherever you happen to be. Uh, you can see some of the early snowboards, and these are only 25 years ago. Um, the earliest snowboards didn't have bindings. You literally stood on it, you held a rope, and you uh, tried to snowboard. It was uh, like a surfboard. And... Um, 
I have tried one of those things. Uh, they did, uh, Burton did re-release re a, a retro version. Um, it's a little bit of novelty, but it's a very simplistic technology. It's kind of like standing on a, on a piece of cardboard and uh, sliding down a grassy hill that you might have, try, might have tried when you were a kid. You're likely to fall over and hit your head, basically. That's the, the takeaway lesson. Of course, in the snowboarding industry, those of you who've done the sport will know that elementary things like how the boots are held to the board by the bindings have changed significantly and rival systems emerge. Burton has recently brought out a new, what we call step-in one, where the boots lock in with a, a simple step-in mechanism. Because one of the frustrations of snowboarding, particularly if you're snowboarding with your skier friends, is having to do up your bindings. And lots of people, they sit down, they do it to do up their bindings and they stand up. That's also why beginner snowboarders find that the most exhausting thing is actually not the snowboarding, but it's just actually getting up um, from each time when you put your, your bindings on. So those technological chains can, chain, changes, innovations, can make for a better product and draw more people in turn into an industry. In so many fields we've seen this. One of the reasons why Apple has become so successful is that they simplify the interface for a range of products, particularly the operating systems of PCs, and they stripped away many of the choices that hardcore users may want, and that's still why people, some people want um, PCs, Windows PCs. But there are many consumers out there who don't need too many choices in the interface, they just want it to work. And that was one of the design principles that Apple brought to their, um, to their products, to their software, and uh, attracted a lot of customers as a result. So this competitive discipline leads to innovation. It also leads to firms in competition to try and find the best uh, talent to work for them. And that's why when we talk about human resource management, we'll see that a key part of that is strategically trying to recruit promising people who can help the company to innovate or to have insight into customer needs that have not been met. So everything in a company gets driven towards uh, constantly innovating services, customer orientation, which over time should make customers better off. That's the hope. So, of course, there's also going to be collaboration in so many ways with the suppliers of various things. Um, Apple quite famously recently collaborated with a small Japanese paint manufacturer to develop a new color of a paint for one of its um, high-end mobile phones, a, a, a distinctive green color. Uh, no company in the United States could make that kind of color, and Apple went looking for suppliers internationally. They heard about the Japanese company, and of course for the Japanese company it was hugely important for them to win a uh, prominent client such as Apple and just help them to sell their product to so many other firms. So these are win-win dynamics. So what happens when competition is limited? Well. Sometimes it's quite natural that competition is limited, um, simply because a company is so good. Um, Zoom has become predominant uh, during the uh, COVID-19 pandemic for the simple reason that it's had the most usable, uh, the most user-friendly uh, application, and so lots of people have embraced it. Once you become familiar with it, it's easy to use it. So this is how de facto standards emerge. We saw that Microsoft became the dominant supplier of word processing documents through, it, through its Office suite. Now, there were other applications in the late 1980s that were equally competitive. There was a rival product called WordPerfect, for example. I wrote my master's thesis on WordPerfect Within a few years, Word had displaced Word Perfect. Uh, it was a rival product, but it had better functionality. Also, very importantly, though, um, Microsoft partnered with IBM and other computer distributors 
to get their software pre-installed in computers that they, sh they shipped. So sometimes it's strategic, sometimes it's not actually that you have the very best product out there. We will, we will see later on in the course that sometimes the preparedness of a company to give away their product or allow other people to use it for free becomes very important um, for it to become a de facto standard. Sony made a strategic mistake with their video cassette technology in the 1980s, Betamax. Betamax was actually a better system than VHS. VHS became the dominant consumer uh, uh, video cassette recorder format even while Sony's Betamax was used in television stations, in professional applications, and the actual cassette was more compact. But Sony was very hesitant to share its proprietary technology with other firms and so it failed to emerge as a common standard. We do see the simple nature of a lot of physical infrastructure means that there are natural monopolies. You know, it doesn't make much sense to build two Shinkansen lines between uh, Tokyo and Osaka just to have the benefits of competition. That would be quite wasteful. So one of the policy challenges is how do you deal with natural monopolies? And we see in, in many cases um, this is an issue. And we'll, we'll, we'll come back and talk about some examples. So one of the dynamics here is what I describe in the lecture notes as collective action dynamics. We all have uh, a benefit from common standards. We know, for example, if we want to share a document with someone, we send, we send it in word format, they will be able to read it because they will have their own computer that will be open, able to open a Word document. Now, I'm an, a bit unusual in that I don't normally work in Word these days, although I, I wrote a PhD in Word. Uh, um, I normally use Apple's Pages app, simple and it, so stable on my Apple devices. But I typically export documents from Pages to Word format, send them to people unless I know they're an Apple user at the other end. Now, because Word, because Microsoft Office has become the default standard, that presents a, uh, an opportunity for, for Microsoft to charge higher prices, a risk, of course, that it would abuse its market position. And so we'll see that there are policies uh, by governments very often to, to deal with those issues of uh, the abuse of market power. Governments do intervene. So we've got a stylized account now of how um, competition in free markets is disciplining and uh, in a sense individual consumers are constantly weighing up uh, their choices and there may be day-to-day -day negotiation if you're buying flowers in the flower market as I mentioned in an earlier model and doing this on a daily basis, there's lots of interaction between the buyer and the seller. There is, in Lindbom's terms, mutual adjustment. Now, the reality for most people, though, when they go to work, and they go to work in a market system, is that they go to work in very often a command-based structure, which is a little bit more like uh, a political system than it is the imagery of the flower market or the fish market or something. And so I want to speak to this, and it's in a slide here titled Command versus Market-Based Coordination. And I want to quote Charles Lindblom here, that we can think of the firm, the hierarchical organization that is the company, we can think of it as islands of command coordination in a sea of market mutual adjustment. What's that mean to say? Of course, you're free to choose between a Nikon camera or a Sony camera or a Panasonic Lumix camera or a Fujifilm camera or whatever. Um, you freely look at that competition. Of course, working for any one of those companies all of those companies, I think, have good corporate cultures and they, they treat their employees with respect, but it is a hierarchical structure. 
you do have section chiefs, you do you do have divisional chiefs, you do you do have vice presidents and whatnot. There is a chain of command, and when uh, there are considerable risk factors or when time is timeliness is very important, organisations are often quite hierarchical. Uh, they often have to be command based. In the practice of medicine, in the military, for example, we have very clear hierarchies of command. Someone needs to be in command. It cannot be a negotiation over everything. Air traffic control cannot be a negotiation between um, pilots freely doing what they want to do and air traffic controllers. The air traffic control controller tells a pilot, this is your uh, flight path, please approach this way at this particular time. You have to do as you're told. Uh, clearly you cannot have aeroplanes just freely moving around um, as they want to do. So this often leads people who are not so comfortable working in the hierarchical structures of organizations to want to be a free agent, to be able to say no to work they don't want to do. And it's always going to be a trade-off. If you want a stable income in a company, to some degree you, you have to submit to authority. Of course, some people are more, are more comfortable, in a sense, following orders than others. Um, and particularly as work becomes more centred on creativity, when there are things like aesthetic judgment involved, this can often be a tension for people. So people working in the fashion industry, for example, they go to work for a big company with a lot of in-house fashion brands. Uh, they might not like being told what to do as a fashion designer by the marketing team. And so there's often going to be tension on how you manage uh, the innovative or the creative process in a effectively top-down, command-driven type um, organization. And that's something we will come back to in a later week. Increasingly, what we're seeing is that firms choose to specialise, uh, that they concentrate their resources in the things that they're particularly good at, and they try to put in command of the organisation people who are highly specialised in that field, uh, or who have specialized experience in, say, managing an organization strategically and can leave the technical aspects to the experts within the organization. That sometimes presents risks that we can talk about later on in the semester. But as companies become more strategically focused, they have to make decisions about what are we good at, what are we not good at, what do we do? What don't we do? What kind of things can we get other people to do for us? What things should we do ourselves? All of us have these decisions to make. Uh, do we become a generalist? Do we become a specialist? Uh, do we cook our own dinner? Do we eat out? Um, partly it depends on the economics of it. Um, if you can eat out cheaply, and if you're a lousy cook, eat out. Um, if you can't go out um, because there's a pandemic, um, then you may have to learn to cook yourself, okay? Or you may be able to get Uber Eats to deliver it to you, for example. So this it's always situational. But these issues of to outsource or to bring it in-house becomes a critical issue when we think about business. And it's very significant from a theoretical and a practical perspective. So my final slide in this section is about what we call simply make or buy. Do you make it yourself or do you buy it in? This It's, it's simple, but it's absolutely key. Uh, it provides the basis for the main set of theoretical issues in thinking about the existence of the firm. Indeed, we call it the theory of the firm in Japanese, kigyodon. And the starting point is what we call transaction costs. Uh, the costs of buying it compared to doing it yourself. And those transaction costs are not just how much you actually have to pay to get someone to do something for you, but all of the search costs, for example, the effort taken to find out uh, what you should buy, who you can safely buy it from, 
That's why these issues of trust and reputation become so important. In a high trust economy, transaction costs fall. In a low trust economy, you may have money to spend, you may have things you want to, to spend it on, but if you can't trust anyone, it will be very difficult to make a decision. Often in those circumstances, companies bring everything inside, inside the company. They do it themselves. And um, it's less a question of trust and more an issue of control then. The top-down control forces everyone in the company to serve the ultimate end goal of making a particular product or providing a service. So you have this island of command. Alternatively, in business environments where there's high levels of mutual trust, um, or very least reputation, and the disciplines of reputation, competitive disciplines, then it's possible to do things on a fluid basis. This is very much the way that Hollywood works. Hollywood and many of the creative industries work on a project basis. Uh, someone has a script, someone has the funding, uh, you get the, uh, the producer, the director, the actors, you put a team together, you do one project. And each person involved has a portfolio of projects that they're doing and their trust the mutual trust and the concern for their reputation leads them to do a good job. And as a consequence, we have to look at the ecology, the environment in which business operates to understand exactly when it's sensible for a firm to do it itself or to, to outsource. This leads us to what we call the boundaries of the firm. Where does the firm stop and where does another firm start? Very often it's not obvious from a consumer's perspective. You know, if you're checking in, well not now, but if you're checking in for a flight on JAL, for example, at the airport, uh, the staff who are serving you may have JAL uniforms on, but they're probably not employed by JAL. They might be employed by a JAL subsidiary called Aisha. Equally possibly, they're employed by a completely unrelated company who... Uh, does all the ground services for a number of airlines and when they're doing the check-in for JAL they put JAL style uniforms on and when they're doing it for another airline they put different uniforms on. So this is something not so obvious to the customers but there is a boundary of the firm behind the scenes and we'll see in many industries um, this in fact uh, is the case. It leads then finally to this question of core competencies. What are the things that a company really good at? And how do they focus on that, uh, concentrate their resources? And then also how do they manage the outsourcing, the collaborations with all of those other businesses that have decided that they're good at some other part of the value chain in providing a particular product or service? And how do you collaborate their in ways that build reputation and stably allow you uh, economically to be competitive in the market compared to your rivals. So in short, this core competencies question, it's hugely important for firms, but it's also something that all of us have to think about um, when we organize our daily lives. Where do we direct our energies? What are we best uh, focusing on and what other things can we afford to outsource to other people or to, in a sense, to collaborate with other people in a win-win kind of way? Thank you.